lockdown working? So we have some signs that it is slowing the epidemic at the moment. Um, so as you'll have heard the um, medical director of the NHS say yesterday, we have just had the first day where actually new admittances to hospital with this virus have um, reduced day on day. I mean, it's early days yet. We do expect to see that slowing down accelerate over the next week. I said yesterday, and I will stay, stand by that, that we think this epidemic in the UK will plateau in the next week to 10 days. What's critically important then is how quickly case numbers go down though. Do we see a kind of long flat peak or do we, as we hope, see a much faster decline? And that really depends on how effective the current measures are. So it sounds like at the moment you expect the peak to arrive around Easter Sunday. We're not at the level of being able to predict to the nearest day when the peak arrives. I would say in the next seven to 10 days, it will be better news if it arrives before then. Very good. Now, you've said um, that you were reasonably confident at the moment, no more than that, that the NHS could therefore cope. Is that still your view? Yes. I mean, the NHS is already under considerable strain. Um, we have over half of IC, ICU capacity um, being occupied by people with COVID-19 right now. And in some areas, it's higher than that. However, the NHS has surged that capacity quite considerably. You'll be aware of the kind of new emergency hospital that's being opened. And so currently we're okay. It's difficult and I don't want to understate at all the amount of work people in hospitals, doctors and nurses are doing, but we are coping. Um, now, obviously the data on all of this is quite difficult, but in terms of deaths, that at one point you said that if we did nothing as a country, more than half a million people could die. And then you said later on that you thought if we all obey these rules, it could be as low as 20,000 deaths. Uh, still, of course, a lot, but still much, much lower. What's your current view? So those view, I mean, those estimates, two estimates you quote, were actually released at the same time in the same report. We looked at a range of options. First of all, we never expected countries to do nothing, but to put into context the scale of the threat, we looked at what would happen if countries did nothing. And given the mortality this virus causes, you get, end up with some very large numbers. We then looked at what would happen if we had a kind of minimal policy of mitigation, you could roughly half those poll numbers. And then concluded, you know, the only viable strategy in terms of keeping health services functioning was something akin to what we're doing now. Uh, and that could reduce numbers, yes, we hope down to of the order of 20,000 or less. And that's where you think we may be heading now? Yes, it's very difficult to make precise predictions at the moment. What we have is an exponentially growing curve of infections, which we interrupted at a certain time. We can't say in terms of the infections precisely where we are on that curve. We don't have the ability right now to measure how many people have been infected. That will come with antibody tests. And so we are making statistical estimates of that. And those are subject to a certain degree of uncertainty. So we think it could be anywhere between about 7,000 or so, up to a little over 20,000. As we will stare at these graphs, um, it depends where you put the starting point. The Financial Times has a graph which puts the starting point a little bit earlier. And on their graph, we're doing slightly worse at the moment than Italy. It's very difficult to make these comparisons because there isn't a fixed starting point. What happened in this epidemic is that people flew into this country with infection and seeded the infection in the country. I mean, Public Health England, the health authorities did their best to intercept such people and isolate them. But we think probably only about one third of infected people were stopped. And so we seeded infection in different areas across the country. Some countries like Northern Italy were very unlucky and clearly got you know, community transmission starting very early. Here it did start a little bit later, but I mean, I think you can, you can spend too much time staring at the graphs, particularly at the beginning of the curves, because they reflect not just what was happening in the country, but also what surveillance was in place as well. I think it's more important to focus on what's happening to the growth rate of the epidemic now. Now, let me turn to the question, and I know the answer to this is difficult, but it's what everybody watching wants me to ask you. You are Professor Lockdown. When is it going to end? So I should just 
correct you. I mean, I'm, I'm characterised Professor Lockdown. We produced scientific evidence along with a lot of other um, scientific groups across the country which fed into government policy, but we did not determine that policy. There are a number of balancing acts involved in doing that. I'm very well aware of the economic impact of this current policy, and we would all like these measures to be able to be relaxed as soon as possible. I can't answer the question directly because the when the lockdown ends will depend really on what happens to this epidemic. So I said at the beginning, how quickly case numbers decline. There is no point to re having gone through this effort and releasing a lockdown at a point where case numbers are still high and then will resurge even faster than we've seen before. We want case numbers to get to a low point where we can start substituting other measures for the most um, intrusive and economically costly aspects of the current lockdown. And almost certainly those additional measures will involve massively ramped up testing, going back to trying to identify contacts of cases and, and stopping chains of transmission. That can only really feasibly be done when we have many fewer cases per day than we have at the moment. Um, one of the other government advisors talked about the danger of us painting ourselves into a corner with all of this. And I suppose the real question is, how do we end the lockdown bit by bit? Does it happen perhaps at different speeds in different geographical areas? Does it happen to different cohorts? So the most vulnerable people, the older, more vulnerable people, stay locked down for longer. Um, and to what extent can we hope that people who have had the coronavirus and have become immune, if they have become immune, can then be given some kind of certificates or wristbands or whatever and be let out earlier? I think aspects of all of those ideas are likely to be employed. I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is the most important question worldwide. No country has an absolute answer to it. There's very intense research going on as to how we do actually get out of this. We warned in our original report, which you know, came out the same day as the lock time that down was announced, that exit strategies from this were very problematic, were, were challenging. Um, there are a number of ideas in play. They certainly will rely on scaled up testing, so we have to get that in place. Um, but the precise strategy has not yet been formulated. Um, it will be in the next week or two. It is the highest priority of, of I would say, the whole scientific and medical community in, in this country, in many countries, and of course, of the policy community. Now, you quite rightly pulled me up a little earlier when I called you Professor Lockdown, and you said you give them the data and they, the ministers, they take the decisions, and that's absolutely right. Nonetheless, your advice has been hugely influential, as you know, and I just wonder, at a kind of human level, how you cope with the question, looking in the mirror in the morning, not the shaving mirror, clearly, but looking in the mirror in the mornings, wondering whether you, you got it right. Yes. Um, I mean, there is enormous sense of responsibility, not just in me on the team as well. And I would emphasize in the UK, we have a very you know, well advanced and thought out structure for scientific advice. So my group may be the most prominent, but there have been seven, eight other uh, groups working on epidemiology and modeling feeding into government. And we all collectively have that sense of responsibility because I mean, I'm very conscious that people are suffering in this country right now. There is a cost an economic, a social, emotional and financial cost to this lockdown and probably a health cost as well. Um, we all want it to be over as quickly as possible, but there's no point to having done this and hopefully successfully suppress transmission unless we can find a strategy which allows us to exit from it, but at the same time keeps transmission low. Professor Ferguson, thanks very much for giving up some of your Sunday morning and coming to talk to us. It's a pleasure. Now, viruses.